Hello, everybody. It is a pleasure to have uh, here uh, today uh, Javier Aizpurúa, uh, that is going to, to tell us about the uh, quantum approaches to nanocavity enhanced molecular spectroscopy. Actually, Javier is a very well known person here in Zaragoza. He studied here, uh, I mean, in Zaragoza, not in YouTube. And then he went to do his PhD in San Sebastian and then did two postdocs, one in Chalmers and another one in Nice in the USA. And then came back to, to San Sebastian where he was a research fellow at the Donostia International Physics Center. And then he moved to the research council in, in Spain where he is now a research a professor. So it's, uh, Javier is a very well-known scientist, a very good friend of mine. And I am sure he is going to give us a fantastic talk. So, Javier, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis, for your kind introduction. This was uh, really, really kind. This was the introduction of a friend, certainly. So, thank you. Uh, thank you for your invitation and David Pecos' invitation to, to be part of the Quantum Tuesdays here in, in Zaragoza, University of Zaragoza, Anima. And uh, I was always uh, feeling jealous uh, of, of the Quantum Tuesdays, because uh, some time ago they were called here Martes Cuanticos. That's what uh, what Luis told me. And, and since I studied in Zaragoza, and I miss very much the, the, the accent from Aragon, this Martes Cuanticos was uh, something I really wanted to take part in. But now Luis informed me that it's not Martes Cuanticos anymore. It's, uh, it's Quantum Tuesdays. It's a little bit more elegant, but still the same spirit, I guess, of uh, closeness and uh, friendship. So. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about our work that we developed in San Sebastian in the Center for Material Physics. Uh, I'm leading a group uh, that devotes uh, its efforts to theory of nanophotonics. And uh, it's a joint center uh, of the Spanish Council and the University of the Basque Country together with the Donost International Physics Center. And in these times of confinement uh, or close to confinement, uh, this is uh, the place where we are. The university is pretty much here, right? And Luis, who is a visitor of ours, uh, a regular visitor of ours, knows that this is a good place to be confined and to, uh, to make sure science and life and life and science. Okay? What I'm going to talk today about is uh, about... Uh, sorry, uh, even, when, even if we try now, we are seeing these two screens that you mentioned before, so... Okay, so... Let me just uh, change the, the screen in sharing mode. And I will share now the whole screen so that I avoid this problem. Okay. Let me know if you can see the whole screen now, Luis. Yes, now no, it's better. Oh, Thanks. good. So that's what I was saying, that we develop our work here and that my talk today is a focus on um, molecular spectroscopies and particular, particularly molecular spectroscopies, which is to probe uh, molecules with light, uh, enhanced and boosted by the action of optical cavities. Right? And this is a... Uh, an old uh, matter in, in optics and in condensed matter uh, physics, right? Uh, people have typically used uh, mirrors, optical mirrors, as cavities to enhance the interaction between light and matter. The use of uh, cavities has basically uh, two targets, right? Uh, on the one hand, by putting two mirrors here, you make light to pass uh, forth and back several times, so you somehow make more effective the interaction of this light with the matter because light passes several times through the matter, right? And, and this typically we measure with a, a magnitude called the quality factor, right? And this is this Q here, which is the inverse of the losses of the cavity. Basically the quality factor, 10, 1 million, uh, 10, to the, 10 to the eight, tells you how many times the photons bounce forth and back before they are lost pretty much. And the other uh, aspect that the cavity tries to improve when it comes to light matter interaction is uh, the space aspect of the interaction, right? You try to, to condensate 
to, to squeeze the electromagnetic density of energy into a, a smaller volume. And by doing these cavities, sometimes we try to trap in space as well, light. And we describe this to another magnitude that I could hear the effective volume of the cavity or the mode of the resonator that tries to trap light. Of course, these cavities, which are made of reflecting mirrors or refractive materials, are diffraction limited. So typically, the effective mode volumes are of the order of lambda q or lambda half lambda q. So in an attempt to improve these two uh, magnitudes, which will govern the improvement and the effectiveness of the interaction of this trap light with matter, people have been developing these other resonators and cavities. Sometimes they are open, like in this micro resonator, uh, but it's a cavity in the sense of trapping the photons here. One can put the matter in these nodes, of these whispering gallium nodes, and interact more effectively between the photons trapped and bouncing in this whispering gallium mode and the matter located around this, uh, this uh, crumb. Right? In an attempt to improve the effective mode volume and reduce it even more, to trap and compensate more uh, larger uh, energy of density, uh, of photonic density, then people have used also photonic crystals with opening gaps, photonic gaps, and then putting a, a single molecule, a quantum dot in a, in a photonic gap and making interaction of this trapped photonic state with matter there. The effective mode volume here is at the limit of diffraction, and then it interacts very intensely, very, very effectively. Right? The last attempt, or one of the last attempts to improve this, has been to make a jump from these reflecting and refractive materials and try to go to metals. And that's what I will focus today on. This is a special type of cavity built of metals, right? And this is a metallic nanoparticle and the skin in, in yellow of a gold or metallic particle and another metallic particle. And in this junction, light will come in and due to the excitation of the collective motion of, of the conduction electrons in the metal, we will build uh, a pseudo uh, photon, trapped photon, a, a quasi particle called oscillation of the plasma frequency that we will call a plasma. Right? And this plasma or, or condensed matter quasi particle will allow us to trap, to get momentum and energy from the photon, trap it, and uh, squeeze it into diffraction non limited uh, effective mode volume. Right? So, in this particular uh, metallic cavities or plasmonic cavities, the effective mode volumes are going to be extremely tiny. Therefore, the interaction, as I will show in a second, will improve with the matter we put here. But the drawback and the price to pay is that because the handling of the photons is done via electrons and electron dynamics of the cavity, these electron dynamics, electrons are very lossy. They, they have lots of ohmic losses associated to them. And then the losses are very large. In other, in other words, the quality factor are very small. Sometimes a good metallic cavity has a quality factor of 10 or 20 in the best case scenario. After 20 optical cycles or 10 optical cycles, the photon is gone. That's the, the trade-off. So you gain in condensating, trapping the energy very, very tiny volumes, interacting more efic efficiently in that volume, but you lose it, the photon very quickly, okay? And this we can see that this special cavity or resonator uh, with very standard optical spectroscopy in, in absorption or in scattering, right? Most of you might be familiar with this. We come with, a, with light of a certain frequency on a nanoparticle, metallic nanoparticle, and we can put a detector in transmission or in scattering and measure the scattering or the absorption cross-sections that peak at a particular photon energy or, or light frequency, which connects with the oscillation of the conduction electrons which we call this uh, quasi-particle or plasma of oscillation. Right? So this plasma, this condensed matter excitation is the key to make the transfer between the propagating photon to a trapped uh, plasma photon polarity, okay? The interesting thing, again, happens right in the effective mode volume. So now around the nanoparticle, the electromagnetic energy associated to the plasma is trapped. Here I show you this, the basic resonance, the dipole resonance. This is positive, this is negative. This would be oscillating at optical frequencies. And the interesting thing, as I say, is that this effective mode volume, even if it's open, is very reduced compared to the wavelength. 
imagine that we have 600 nanometers optical light wavelength, and this particle is of the order of 10, 20 nanometers. So we are reducing factors of 50 or 60 or 100, the wavelength into the dimensions where we trap that photon, right? those photons associated to the incoming light. Here's another way to see this. This is the nanoparticle with induced charge, and here is the field enhancement associated to this pulse of light, which is coming, and this is the plasma. It uh, lasts for femtoseconds, it's very short-lived, and here we are pumping it all the time, so that's why it's oscillating the whole time, okay? But this is a plasma. Somehow, I always say that we are kind of cheating because we can call this a plasmonic cavity, but it's not technically a cavity, right? It's just a resonator, an open resonator, but it acts as a cavity in the sense that it's trapping uh, the light in those nano uh, bodies, okay? More interestingly, that this concept of the open nano resonator in a metallic nanoparticle, which has associated this trap effect with more volume, uh, people in plasmonics, uh, we have tried to sophisticate this concept of resonator by simply uh, making a very, very simple thing, which is to put another particle, uh, another metallic nanoparticle close to this first resonator. When you do that, and this is what I show you here below, you have two metallic nanoparticles and the resonator of the top and the resonator of the bottom interact via Coulomb interaction, because remember that these are oscillating dipoles, oscillating charges, and if you put the bottom of this particle and the top of this particle closer together, the oscillating charges interact via Coulomb, and as a result of that, they produce a hybridized solution, a hybridized plasma oscillation, a hybridized mode of resonator, that traps light even farther. So compared to the single nanoparticle open that uh, traps light in the nanoscale, but in a kind of open uh, fashion, the metallic junction or the metal insulator metal, for those of you working in tunnel junctions, uh, is a very effective, uh, even more effective plasmonic or metallic cavity. And in this case, we can properly talk about the cavity because the plasmonic cavity, it's even a physical cavity. It, it's, it's a junction, it's a cavity. So on top of being a resonator, like here on top, this uh, is also a cavity. So when I talk about plasma cavities, I think in this junction, it's legitimate to call it cavity in this sense. Very often people call this type of resonators antennas, just very simple. And because they are in the nanoscale, they are nano antennas. And the reason why they do this is because these optical resonator are very effective in trapping light from the far field and sending it back to the far field. So they really act as very good antennas, optical antennas, and we call it nano antennas. But sometimes we use all this terminology and it seems we do it on purpose to confuse uh, the audience, right? Or, or the people. So we, are, we can use the word plasmonic nano antenna, plasmonic resonator, nanoscale junction, metallic junction, uh, nanoscale optical antenna, all those terms mean the same. It's some kind of trapping of the far field light into the nanoscale thanks to this collective oscillation of the conduction electrons in a metal. You can do it more effectively, less effectively, but that's basically the concept. Now, what do we do with these uh, cavities? Well, on the other hand, we want to prove matter. We can prove the condensed matter, the, the condensed matter, or we can prove molecules, single molecules. I will show you here mainly molecules, but it can be extended to matter, layers, bidimensional layers, etc. When we want to prove uh, molecules, basically we want to do a spectroscopy and interrogate the, the essence, the nature of those molecules in terms of uh, basic excitation that we activate in them, right? One is a typical uh, vibration. This you can prove with direct infrared absorption here on the left, you can see a molecule that is vibrating. You send infrared light, you see how much is absorbed or not absorbed as a function of the infrared light. And you see where the peak is, you know where the vibrational mode, energy and lifetime is. Right? If you use optical light, you can also prove electronic transitions of this molecule. For example, in fluorescence, you excite an excited electronic state, it relaxes. And then when finally it emits, you, you get this light, this is fluorescent. Right? And you can even induce an inelastic process mediated by one of these vibrations, but with visible light, light coming in and producing a phonon, 
a vibration in the molecule and light coming out of less energy. This is an Stokes process, and this is this Raman scattering. In all these spectroscopies, when you come directly with light to probe molecules, the cross section, the, the effectiveness of these interactions between the photons and the excitations in the molecule is very low. It, it is short, it's, it's very hardly detectable for single molecules or for a few molecules. You need huge amounts of molecules to get some signal over the noise recording this infrared absorption or this fluorescence or this Raman scan. So in this context is where uh, all I have just mentioned up to now comes in, this optical cavities, right? When we use this plasmonic or metal insulator metal cavities, and we put our molecules in the middle of these uh, metallic cavities, we improve the effective mode volume and therefore the interaction of the trapped photons with that molecule. We can do that with the excitons for fluorescence or with the vibrations in infrared or RAM, right? So in this sense, when we use metals uh, to improve these uh, spectroscopies, people have talked about surface enhanced absorption or scattering or fluorescence. And when it comes to vibrations, people have also used surface enhanced infrared absorption, SEDA, or surface enhanced Raman scattering, SERS. And the reason why people use this surface enhanced and this terminology, this comes from the 70s when people just put the molecules uh, on top of the electrodes of metallic electrodes in electrochemistry. And they saw that the Raman signal was improved by several thousand times. And they didn't know why this happened. And they call this effect like a surface enhancing effect, like a surface enhanced spectroscopy. Then with the time, we knew that uh, what was produced in the metals mainly were this uh, plasmonic enhancements, this collective oscillation of the conduction electrons that were producing trapping on effective mode volumes and enhancement of the local fields. And that's why people uh, kept talking about surface enhanced, even though now we could talk about plasmonic antenna enhanced or plasmonic junction enhanced or metallic nanoparticle enhanced, okay? So the, the, the reason to, to call it surface enhanced is purely historical. Now we could sophisticate it with the particular type of surface or nanoparticle or nanostructure we are studying, okay? Again, to not lose the track, what is the whole important thing here? The whole important thing is that when we use this plasmonic nano junctions, nano cavities, we reduce this effective mode volume of the optical resonator, and we are going to interact better with the molecule and obtain a better signal, Raman, fluorescence, whatever we are. That's the whole target, okay? And I will show you in a second that this effective mode volume is important and we need to reduce it precisely because the interaction, the coupling strength, both for plasma exciton or plasma vibration, is basically proportional to the inverse of this effective mode volume or to the inverse of the square root of this effective mode volume. This is the coupling strength of plasma exciton. This is the, the coupling strength of vibration uh, plasma, okay? But you see that these uh, interacting energies uh, scale with the inverse of the effective mode volume. So a smaller effective mode volume, more interaction, larger Gs or energies of interaction. These people have seen, as I tell you, almost uh, with surfaces like in the 70s and 80s, but with nanoparticles and nano antennas 20 years ago, the group of Michael Scherr in Sweden, for example, he was using this type of junctions. Here on the top left, you see two metallic nanoparticles. They, they act as a nano antenna. Light comes in, it's getting trapped here in the middle. You can see actually a near field optical microscopy image of this uh, trap light in the junction. Now, if you put here hemoglobin like they did, you see that the, the signal, the vibrational fingerprints, the vibrational modes of this hemoglobin are boosted just thanks to the action of this trap light, which is probing more effectively the hemoglobin that is particularly located in the middle of the gap, okay? And people talk in this context of hot sides in this plasmonic cavity, not hot because of temperature, but hot because of the electromagnetic enhancement, okay? It's, it's hot electromagnetically, so to say. But that's terminology that you can uh, listen quite often in, in, in the context of spectroscopies and surface enhancers spectroscopy. Now, all this introduction in the, in the, in the context of cavities to boost uh, molecular and, and condensed matter optical spectroscopies, 
is getting us to a, to a place where we are getting to the limits of these cavities. And I'm putting here two examples of extreme uh, cavities that people are using nowadays, right? Here on the left, you see a canonical example of a, a atomic scale plasmonic cavity, right? This is the tip of a tunneling microscope or an atomic force microscope on top of a metal substrate. And this tip on the metal substrate forms a natural plasmonic cavity. Light can come here, get trapped in the junction, in the cavity, and probe better a molecule that you put here, for example. This is a top-down approach, uh, and it's quite sophisticated. It requires uh, ultra-high vacuum, low temperature, and people, for example, in Hefe, Saint Chaudon, or in Strasbourg, Guillaume Schuller are, are exploiting these spectroscopies at the single molecular level. I will show you some uh, results in a second. There's another approach in this extreme plasmonic cavities, which is a more is based on a more bottom-up uh, procedure, right? In wet chemistry. You, there's a metallic uh, substrate here, this gold film. You put your molecules, this self-assembly monolayer spacer here on top of the metal, and now you deposit a metallic gold nanoparticle, for example, and you sandwich this sum, this self-assembly monolayer. And now you can come with light with your dark field or Raman or, or any kind of optical spectroscopy and probe more effectively this self-assembly monolayer uh, in the middle. We do this, for example, with the group in Cambridge. Uh, there are other groups in the US and all over the world that practice this kind of plasmonic junction particle on a mirror, often called a spectroscopy. Okay. What happens with this uh, kind of uh, cavities, and why do I call them a stream? Uh, well, what happens with these kind of cavities is that they are uh, getting to the limits of matter at the atomic scale, and they are playing with photons at the dimensions of atoms. So that's why I call them extreme. I will show you in a second. In order to address the interaction of these trapped photons in the plasmonic cavities with these molecules at the single molecule level, we, start, we need to start departing from classical approaches. Why? Because we are basically dealing with single molecules, single atoms, single uh, photons uh, jumping. And then the classical description is limited. We need to go to, to quantum approaches. And, and in this talk, I want to throw the idea that when you want to, to apply quantum mechanics to describe nanophotonics and light matter interaction, you can do it at several levels, right? So to say quantum approach to nanophotonics means nothing, really. And, and that's what we do in the group, right? We do different kinds of quantum approaches to address different problems within nanophotons, okay? And I, you will see now in a second what I mean. First of all, we have an aspect of the quantum approach to nanophotonics in this plasmonic nanophotonics, which deals with the cavity itself. The cavity, which is a metal, insulator metal, it's built of electrons and photons that come in. And uh, when you start getting to the atomic scale, the quantum nature of this conduction electrons oscillating is expressed, okay? it, it's magnified. And then you start needing to pay attention to this. I will show you examples in a second, right? There is another aspect of the quantumness or the quantum description when you deal with the spectroscopies, which is the quantum nature of the molecule or the condensed matter you want to probe. Now we put a molecule here, and this molecule is not a point dipole or it's not an oscillating single point. It's, it's an object which has wave functions spread in space and therefore a quantum chemistry approach to describe the electronic transitions, the, the extension in space of that might be very important in this context, particularly as at the single molecule spectroscopy level. And there is even a third uh, aspect of a quantum approach to interaction of light and matter, which is connected with the quantization of this local field, of the trap field itself. In the fashion of cavity quantum electrodynamics, the quantization of the plasmonic field in a plasmon cavity and how this quantized field interacts with the vibrations and the excitation might give rise to nonlinearities, coherent effects, correlations, and statistics, which are interesting in, in a quantum up sense because of the quantum properties of the photons uh, exchange with the matter. Right? So again, when you talk about quantum approaches, well, you, you might 
focus more on one aspect or the other. And sometimes we combine a couple of the aspects, but we forget about the other and we treat classical light for, for this uh, excitation of, of the quantum electrons. But we treat here fully the, the quantization of the field, but we forget about the electrons and the electrons for us, it's just a dielectric function, et cetera, et cetera. What is very hard is to get the three aspects of them uh, combined, right? There are some groups who are trying to do it, but it's, it's really demanding. So let me show you now, after this uh, 20 minutes of, um, of uh, introduction, what, uh, what we do and some of the things we have done addressing the quantum nature of the cavity of the molecules we put here. And I don't think I will have time to pay attention to the quantization of the localized field, but maybe some other day we can, we can do it. So let me show you some of the nice things and nice properties, physical properties that emerge when you pay attention to the quantum nature of, the, of this plasmonic metallic um, cavity. And most of the descriptions, or many descriptions in nanophotonics, people take this plasmonic uh, metallic particles, like this two that I show you here, a uh, light comes in, and they solve it in, in terms of classical description of uh, photonics and Maxwell equations, solving Maxwell equations through a dielectric microscopic response of the metal. And then you get pretty much the main features of localization of, of light, right? And if you zoom in here, you can still do at this nanoscale level, this same classical description. And one would see that uh, you get this trapping of light, of plasmonic light uh, at the order of five to 10 nanometers. And this five to 10 nanometers is pretty much the lateral extension of a plasmon in a cavity like that, which will depend on this uh, thick radius and things like that. So we do that um, classically, you can do classically, but when you start paying attention to, to what kind of uh, features and properties you have uh, at the atomic scale, then this microscopic description in terms of sharp surfaces and dielectric functions loses its sense, right? Even the, the full nature of the microscopic description of a dielectric function loses it, its essence, right? So we need to go to some kind of quantum description of the electron gas in the metal that describes and builds up the response. And that's what we have done. You can do this at different levels, right? And one very successful level has been to use the time-dependent density functional theory, I will show you in a second, where you describe the electron gas through this uh, conical orbitals, you establish a box, a potential, confined, uh, a potential well confining the particles, and your light comes in here as a perturbation, and you follow the dynamics of this electron, including all the interactions. So when you do that, compared to a Maxwell classical description, you can account for quantum size effects, uh, dynamical screening, these non-local interactions, many local interactions of the electron, a spill out, which might be very important close to the molecules, atomistic effects, electron paneling at optical frequencies, things like that, right? It's still with a kind of soup description of the electron gas, which is called GIL, right? So let me show you how it works. For example, we have two metallic particles here, and we want to know what the electrons, the conduction electrons in these two particles, how they respond to a pulse. A pulse which has a carrier envelope phase, which can be moved, and we want to show what is the response for that. How we calculate that? Well, we need to solve, again, a nonlinear time-dependent Schrodinger equation, where we express these electrons through these Xe uh, conisham orbitals, we have here the potential, the kinetic energy of the electrons, the confining potential of the goal, exchange correlation, Hartley potential, and the external potential, which is given by this pulse, right? So you put all these ingredients in your Hamiltonian, and we solve it in time domain, in the wave packet propagation scheme, and we see how this Konisham orbital, these orbitals uh, describing the electron dynamics evolve in time. When you do that, you can sum all of them and obtain the electron density of this system, how it evolves in time. From the electron density, you can also obtain the induced dipole moment of the system in time. If you Fourier transform this, you would get the response in frequency. The imaginary part of that would be the polarizability, for example. This uh, current density can actually uh, be connected with the current density within the gap. This current density can be expressed in terms of this Konisham orbitals in time as well. 
If you integrate the current intensity, you can obtain the intensity through the gap. And if you integrate in time, you get the number of electrons transferred. So by doing this quantum treatment in a plasmonic cavity as a response to a pulse of light, you can trace in time in femtosecond scale what the electrons are doing, how they are moving, basically. And when doing that, we have identified many interesting regimes in, in nanophotonics, right? For example, here, a regime of quantum tunneling between two particles, tunneling at optical frequencies that change dramatically the modes, for example, of this cavity. Or nonlinear responses, when you increase the intensity of the light coming in, you have generation here in frequency of higher order modes. We also have active control. We can calculate this system now putting a static bias here, a DC bias, and see how you can have active control of the dynamics. But more than 1,000 words, an image is usually more worthwhile. Let me show how this works in a result, right? We have here the, the cavity, metal, gray metal here. This is the pulse coming in, which is an ultra fast single uh, cycle optical pulse here. And this is the potential of the two particles that are oscillating due to the oscillation of the optical potential in the gap as a function of this excitation of the incident pulse. And what we show here is the emergence of the electrons that are taken out by the uh, optical potential of this pulse. Again, the pulse comes here, up, the first electron is extracted, it reverses polarizability, some of them quiver, some of them are extracted, so all this uh, complex picture of colors on the right is the motion, the dynamics of the electrons in the gap as a response to this single pulse where we can control the carrier envelope phase, the amplitude, et cetera. We can follow the potential, we can follow the electrons, the currents, the number of electrons transferred in this photo emitted electrons. Right? And people can do that. This is not uh, something academic. People are building with this, uh, the lithographic techniques, this kind of bow tie antennas, metal, insulator metal, they come with this kind of pulses and they induce photocurrents, right? And they measure them. And then we have calculated exactly this kind of system. Now you understand this, this is the metal, metal, this is the time evolution. And you can see how the electrons are extracted, quiver, extracted. You can integrate in time to get the currents. Uh, experimentally, they can come with two pulses and measure out the correlations of the photocurrents with time delay. And we see that our uh, time dependent density function of theory and motion reproduces this experiments here in this cross section. You can see that the current burst, the photo induced currents last less than one femtosecond. So this is ultra fast photo currents, photo emitted currents that we can identify and describe within this uh, dynamics study of the electrons. Right? And this is the response, the plasmonic response of the cavity, which is helping to extract the electrons. And once they are extracted, they follow just the potential of the, of the atoms, right? One more thing, and five more minutes before we make a, a, a little short for some questions, uh, is we can go beyond this description of this a smooth gillium or a, even classical or gillium quantum description and start paying attention even at the smaller scale, not, not just at 5, 10, 20 nanometers, but really going to the atom and try to, to see what happens with the electrons, with the, with the conduction electrons and, and, and so on at this scale. And why this is interesting? Well, again, because if we want to boost and increase the signal from excitons and vibrations of molecules and these scales, the interaction, and the signal scales with the inverse of the effective mode volume, if we manage to trap the photons at the tiniest effective mode volume, we will improve this interaction at the maximum, at the optimal level, right? And I show you an example of this. This is again, this extreme cavity, the tip, plasmonic tip uh, on metal substrate. We put the molecule and this experiment done seven years ago by the group of Saint Chaldon in Cafe was a real breakthrough right? because they sent light in, they excited the vibrations of the molecule, light, Raman light was sent out with the phonons excited here, and they recorded this Raman photon, right, map. And these are the Raman photon uh, spectra, right, as a function of centimeters minus one, and they detected several vibrational fingerprints, 
when they scan the plasmonic tip, they manage to map for every single vibrational mode, they map within a resolution of less than one nanometer. This is optical Raman photo maps with a resolution of one nanometer. And if you remember, I was telling you that the best plasmonic confinement is of the order of five to 10 nanometers. There is no way that with this kind of classical or even a smooth gillium described local field, we can describe this level of resolution. So there must be something at the sub uh, 10 nanometers scale that traps light to be able to resolve this count, right? And with the help of the group of Daniel Sanchez Portal here in, in San Sebastian, which are expert in ab initial calculations, they calculated precisely uh, with time dependent density functional theory, but in frequency domain, not in time domain, that's uh, perturbative. Uh, they calculated the response of this kind of junctions at the atomistic level. They put here, for example, a tip metal on a flat metal. This is tip to facet. And as a function of separation distance, this separation distance, they mapped, they, they plotted the effective mode volume of such a system. And they saw that the effective mode volume of these kind of cavities is a smaller, can be a smaller than one cubic nanometer. This is the extreme example of optical cavity because it's below nano cavity we, we call it maybe abusing a little bit the language pico cavity and this pico cavity is nothing but the photons trapped at almost a single atom level in a metal combined with the whole uh, os collective oscillation of the plasma here i mean if you put just one atom here you will get a very small polarizability of this atom but this atom mounted on top of the whole plasmonic oscillation provides this extra, extra factor that uh, provides this uh, confinement. So now with this confinement at the pico cavity level, we can come and try to reproduce these experiments of the Raman and see how in the simulation with this pico cavity so scanning the molecule, we can recover for every single vibrational fingerprint, the level of resolution of 10 experimental. This is a proof that the pico cavity in the tunnel injunction, a few one, two, three atoms in the, in the uh, tip of a tunneling junction scanning are mapping with a resolution which is close to the electronic uh, current resolution, okay? At this point, I think that because I introduced the, the plasmonic cavity, the extreme plasmonic cavity, which is a pico cavity, and I wanted to show you now what to do with it in, in plasmons and vibrations in another 15, 20 minutes. Maybe Luis, you want to do some question quickly if there's any or, or if there isn't, I, I keep going. Yeah, actually there is no questions in the chat, but I have uh, one. In this uh, last example that you hear, uh, how do you model the tip? Is it just a few atoms or extended? So in, in this particular case, Actually, what we what we actually do, uh, and actually I'm going to show you something that I have here for that kind of question. <laughs> this one, which was hidden, and now I show you. So uh, when you have this kind of tips and you want to reproduce the the image, the kind of local field you have to assume. Technically speaking, would be this kind of the, the local field given by this quantum calculation that I just described, right? The whole atomistic description, and this is the one on the left, and this is the description of the of the quantum field. But what we found recently, a couple of years ago, is that if one takes a classical solver with the dielectric functions of metal, and you put and uh, reproduce the boundaries, the sharp boundaries, classically of the electronic density profile of your metal, you reproduce quite nicely the amplitude of the local field enhancement and the distribution of this local field enhancement around this pico cavity. So we can use in our simulation, depending on the level of sophistication you want, but in most cases, when you want to reproduce tunneling images at, at this, with this level of resolution, it's enough that at the typical 20 nanometers radio tip, you add uh, this little uh, extra hemisphere of a few one nanometer or two nanometers with this kind of uh, curvature 
to get this peak of cavity localization and scan with that. And that works very, very well. Okay. Now there is a question by Inyo Iguskiza. It uh, says that you are describing the coupling as a scaling with the effective volume. In quantum uh, cavity electrodynamics, there is a lot of discussion about the light matter coupling strength be limited by uh, TRK. RK. Uh, what about here? TRK. Yeah, well, there, there are many limitations to this. Actually, one, this was one of my last uh, slides. So, technically speaking, let me, yeah, here is, it was actually one of the next uh, slides, right? Uh, technically speaking, when you describe this interaction of the local field acting on an exciton or, or a point dipole, uh, the, the dependence on the effective mode volume comes from this quantization of the field, right? A typical, a canonical quantization of the local field that involves here the square root of the inverse of the effective mode volume, right? And these local fields comes in the coupling strength, right? Because it's the one acting on the dipole. And then you can describe this interaction between the, the creation of an excitation with the annihilation of a photon or the, the creation of a photon with the annihilation of the, of the electronic excitation through this coupling strength, which is typically called James Kahn, right? Now, limitations of this, well, all of them, I mean, rotating wave approximation, if you start having a, a strong intensities of the, of the fields coming in and driving the process, uh, non-linearities, uh, presence of extra states, dark states, coupling of the exciton and the excited states to other things rather than the optical cavity. So this dipolar um, limitation is, 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 is there, but not only at the E, I, K, R, at KR uh, level, but also at other levels, description of the states, rotating with approximations, Markovian. I mean, there are many limitations to this canonical description of the exciton trap photon interaction. But, but it describes also very nicely many things, okay? Not all of them. Okay, there, there are no questions, Javier. Okay, so very quickly, I will renormalize the, 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 the talk. I, I will focus more on plasmon exciton and I, I would leave plasmon vibration for some of the day or some of my collaborators in another quantum Tuesday. But uh, and it comes along the, the questions of Inigo Ruskita, right? These uh, limitations as well and what we can do. Uh, I, I'm going to show you that what people or what we do typically to describe plasmon exciton is useful and it works quite nicely, typically, but it has also certain limitations, right? And I will show you some of them in the next 15 minutes or 20 before we close. So this is the, 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 the situation I want to address now, right? This is twin nano or pico cavity probing a single molecule with this kind of interaction, right? When we want to describe this, I, I just introduced the Hamiltonian that describes this, this kind of James Cami Hamiltonian, a, a simple exciton, uh, photon coupling. Classically, you can address this even classically, right? I mean, this is the cavity, nano or pico cavity. If we put here a couple of atoms, like uh, what we were talking with Luis uh, now, Martin Moreno, is if you put here a little hemisphere, you would be creating a pico cavity here, okay? So this kind of cavity inter has a local field associated with it. It's this trap local field. We call it sometimes near field, local field, uh, cavity photons, and they are, again, uh, characterized by this magnitude of the local field and the losses, the kappa, losses of the cavity or of the resonator, right? And we want to probe our electronic excitation in the molecule. We are going to put the molecule here nearby, and the molecule has a transition between a ground state and an excited state, and this excited state also has a lifetime, gamma, uh, which is uh, the, the lifetime of the, of the excitonic state, right? And this transition between the excited and the ground state can be described through a dipolar moment of the molecule, right? We all know that. So now, in order to describe the interaction of the, this dipolar moment in this local field, we just do the standard description, right? It's the energy of the interaction. And the energy of the interaction that we will call G or H bar G is the coupling strength also called, or the coupling rate. 
call it as you wish, coupling rate, coupling strength, energy of interaction. And it's nothing but the local field, this local field of the cavity acting on the dipolar moment. Okay? And this is what I just told to Inigo Ruskita now, as we can actually put this coupling strength in an interacting Hamiltonian with more or less limitation to describe this interaction. Okay? And that's the reason, because of this quantization of the local field, that this coupling strength escapes with the inverse of the square root of the effective mode volume. So a smaller effective mode volume, more coupling. Now we can distinguish two main regimes. Right? There are more, but two main regimes of interaction, right? And which govern the, the decays and the interaction, the interacting energy. Right? If this interacting energy or interacting rate, it's uh, it's a smaller than the cavity decay or the exciton decay, we talk about weak coupling. Somehow the interaction between the dipole and the local field doesn't have the time to really interact before the photon of the cavity goes away or the exciton of the molecule decay. There is a slight interaction and in the energy landscape, both the optical mode and the excitonic mode, which if they are put in a similar energy, interact, they interfere, but they don't affect the energetics of each other so much, right? What this effect is, is uh, expressed by is by an interference, and an acceleration of the decay of the exciton. So there is interaction, it's weak, but there is. And this acceleration of the exciton decay is what we call typically parcel effect, okay? In the time domain. In the energy domain, there is almost similar energy with interference. In the time domain, there is acceleration of the exciton. This is weak coupling rate. Now, if the coupling rate is large, the interacting energy is large, this means that the interaction occurs very fast much faster than the cavity or the, or, the, or the molecule decays. Therefore, both optical mode and exciton build, due to the interaction, a combine a hybrid solution, a polaritonic solution with two branches, right? Two polaritonic solutions, which are this uh, lower and upper polarity. And now these energetics of the whole system is changed. Now you don't have one or the other, you have two polaritons that be below to the combined system, right? And in time domain, if you probe these states in time, you would see oscillation of the populations between these two states in time that we call radio states. So the summary of what I just said about the regimes of couplings is that in wind coupling, in an emission spectrum of a molecule, you would have a broadening and acceleration of the emission. And this is in time, acceleration of the emission. Whereas in a strong coupling, you would have polaritonic split in energy and frequency of the two polaritonic branches. And in time, you will have this Rabi oscillation. So you see that both in a spectroscopy, the weak and the strong coupling regime are very different, single peak, double peak, well distinguished. And in time domain, in case you, one is able to do a, a pump and probe or a time domain spectroscopy of the population of the state, in weak regime, one would see exponential acceleration decay of the exciton decay. And in the other strong coupling case, you would see this Rabi oscillation, okay? So let me show you uh, two examples of each in this extreme plasmonic cavities, which boost these G factors, right? One is again, the tunneling junction, this tip on top of the metal substrate. And we put here a zinc thalocyanine molecule. This is a very good emitter. It's a flat molecule with the dipole aligned in parallel to the, to the surface. And then the nice thing about this tunneling plasmonic junction is that you can move the tip, of course, in a scanning probe. Uh, and by moving the tip, you move the plasmonic cavity over, over and scan the molecule, right? So we can put the plasmonic cavity by locating the tip in position one on top of the molecule or very far, position three, or in between. If we put it very far, it will not interact at all, and you will get just a, a spectroscopy, the emission of the plasma, the plasmonic mode, the resonator mode. And this is what I show you here, right? We put the tip very far from the molecule, you excite, instead of light, this is with an elastic current of electrons, and then you record the light emitted, and this light shows this broad plasmonic resonance. This is a plasmonic resonance. This is the plasmonic cavity or resonance, or plasmonic junction resonance, okay? Now, if we put 
and excite directly the, the tip on top of the molecule. We screen the cavity actually because of the molecule. And what we see is directly the emission from the exciton. This is a much thinner emission from the exciton of the molecule between the excited and the ground state. And you put the detector here and you see it here. But now, if you put the cavity here in between with the exciton of the molecule and the plasma of the cavity interacting, look at the result. The, re the result is amazing. It's a perfect interference between this plasmonic mode and this excitonic mode with the emergence of a destructive interference often called phano like profile, a phano interference, right? Of a continuum, a broad resonance and a discrete state, a thinner resonance, right? This, and this you can describe even classically with two harmonic oscillators, a broad a band harmonic oscillator and a thin harmonic oscillator, and they would provide exactly this type of spectroscopy, right? And this is an example of weak coupling. Why? Because the dipole of the molecule is aligned perpendicular to the local field of the cavity. If we manage to put the point dipole aligned with the local field of the cavity, then we could get a strong coupling. And actually, this is what uh, the group in Cambridge of Jeremy Bomber did in this situation, right? They have this particle in a mirror, and they managed to put this metal in blue with an emitter inside a barrel, a cucurbit real organic molecule, with the dipole pointing upwards. And because of this alignment of the dipole pointing upwards and the local field in the plasmonic cavity, they managed to obtain the split in the two polaritonic branches in frequency spectroscopy, which identifies the strong coupling regime of a single emitter in a plasmonic nanocouple. And since then, uh, and a takeoff of, of exploitation of this plasmonic nanocavity has a core, right? And people have put here J aggregates, molecules, quantum dots, and, and people have used a variety of, of uh, cavities, right? Uh, this plasmonic open triangle resonators, this cavity that I just mentioned, bow ties, uh, tip on substrate, and this all have been showing. A weak coupling, strong coupling, depends on the situation, okay? In the last uh, 10 minutes, I probably want to address some of the aspects of this uh, quantum chemistry of the pro that we put there, right? And what happens in this description that I just mentioned of the exciton local field, plasmonic field interaction in this uh, fashion is that most often in nanophotonics up to now, we have been using the description of this dipolar moment, the transition between the ground and the excited state as a point dipole. This was uh, the assumption, right? That this uh, oscillation, this transition, electronic transition could be associated to a point dipole located somewhere, right? But one can imagine that this works for public period cavities, for micro resonators, even for photonic crystal cavities, but it, when it comes to plasmonic cavities or even plasmonic pico cavities, where we are localizing the field in a few atoms or in a few nanometers, the point dipole here, this mu that I put here with this arrow, is located somewhere in the middle of this strongly inhomogeneous plasmonic. The plasmonic resonator, the near field, the local field associated to the plasmonic resonator is extremely inhomogeneous. So to put something, a molecule, which is of the order of one nanometer or two nanometers in a field that decays in less than one nanometer is again an approximation. And here you certainly have this approximation of E, I, K, R, which work in principle, but not for these evanescent loads, right? So this is not the standard photon in quantum, um, in, and cavity electrodynamics, right? Quantum electrodynamics, where you have the quantization of the photon and it interact. No, here you have an evanescent field. You have to quantize this evanescent field, right? So now what we propose is to account for the quantum nature, the extent, the quantum extension of this dipole in the particular inhomogeneous field and see what happens, right? And when you put, for example, this molecule here, and that's what uh, what we want to do, right? This is again, the point dipole approach. We have a point mu dipole in a local field and we want to go beyond this. What we're gonna do is substitute this point dipole by the actual 
distribution of electronic states of the molecule, in this case, this pottering, this raw of EG is the transition electronic density between the excited and the ground state. This is the title of moment. And then we built an interaction energy, a coupling strength as an integral that convolutes the transition electronic density by the extension of the inhomogeneous plasmonic potential, the plasmonic field, right? So this plasmonic field, phi of PL, plasmonic field, inhomogeneous in, in a space, is integrated with the a spatial distribution of the transition density. And this modifies the actual interaction and description of the coupling strength. Let's compare how the result of one point type of basic approach and the full quantum chemistry model describing the, the, the molecule differs, right? See, what is the, the difference? Here I put this point uh, arrow with the point dipole and this is what really the dipole of the molecule like looks like. This is the transition uh, electronic density of this zinc power center, right? And we put it here in the pico cavity. This is what I was telling Luis Martin Moreno before. If I want to describe the resolution in these cavities, it's enough that to the standard mm, nano cavity, I add this pico bump and reproduces the localization of a few atoms at the atomic scale. So when one does do this, we can map by moving this pico cavity scanning the coupling strength, the coupling energy G as a function of position of this pico cavity and get how the G of the full quantum model compared to the point dipole changes, not only qualitatively, but quantitatively. You see that the full model gives a smaller coupling strength, a factor of two, but more importantly, the full quantum model maps the four low, maybe here it cannot be seen so clearly, but there is a four low here that in the point dipole is missed completely. So actually having the combination of the pico cavity field plus the extension of the, of the electronic transition resolves at the nanoscale, at the, at the atomic scale, the emission, this G to the square is proportional to the emission of this kind of molecule. So we are somehow proving academically the, molecule, the molecular emission with atomic scale uh, resolution, right? Can we do, and with this I'm finishing, can we do this, uh, take it to the reality, to check it with experiments again? I show you Raman before, but what about fluorescence, this excitonic emission? Yes, we did this with uh, Guillaume Chou in Strasbourg. He used one of these tunneling plasmonic cavities. He put this kind of uh, talocyanine, this is a free base. So this talocyanine has these two hydrogens here. And this talocyanine is a very good emitter, but it shows two tautomers in, in, in chemistry as well. Not these two tautomers are uh, object, molecular objects with the same composition, but they have a different uh, a structural organization of some atoms. So same chemical composition, but different structural disposition of the atoms, right? And then if you have these hydrogen atoms like this or like this, you have the same molecule, but one, for example, will emit with the dipole in this direction, and the other one will emit with the dipole in this direction. So actually, uh, the, the group in the Strasbourg Guillaume put this molecule in this plasmonic cavity, activated it with the current, and mapped the emission from this molecule in the plasmonic cavity, right? And this is the result, both in the spectroscopy and in the mapping. Here on the left, you can see this spectroscopy. We will focus on these first two peaks, QX1 and QX2. These are the same peak here, QX1 one and QX2, which are orthogonal to each other because they are the emission corresponding to tautamer one with the hydrogens in this direction and tautamer two with the hydrogens in perpendicular direction. They should be degenerate, but because the molecule is located on top of the substrate, metallic substrate, there is a slight tension, uh, surface tension in, in an adaption of the molecule in one of the directions that breaks the degeneracy. So this QX1 and QX2 in a perfect substrate would be degenerate, but because of the substrate, they break the degeneracy. And this allows to filter the emission of one tautomer and the emission in blue of the other tautomer and see how they are orthogonal to each other when you map, uh, scan this emission in space. So this is the experimental result. And now we have to apply in this last couple of minutes, 
All I have told you about the pico cavities, the coupling strength, uh, and the molecule the extension to interpret this result. Again, the result of this experimental image of the mission is quite complex. You see here that it's orthogonal, but you see here two yellow maxima, blue cut here in the middle. It's quite complex, right? So now this is what we need to, to describe. Again, these two emissions of the tautomer. And what we do is, as I say, to apply what I just described in the whole segment. This is the plasmonic tip on a substrate cavity, the molecule here. And the mission is going to be governed by the product of the pumping efficiency and the emission probability, right? So we need to inject electrons, produce the exciton. And once the exciton is produced, this exciton will emit in the middle of this plasmon cavity according to the coupling. Right? So we need to address both this pumping efficiency and the emission probability. Uh, let's do it. Let's start with the emission. The emission is going to be proportional to this coupling strength to the square. Fermi called this rule. I mean, this is the emission. So we need to calculate G. But I show you just a second ago how to calculate G. G is this integral in a space of the plasmonic inhomogeneous field multiplied by the, the spatial distribution of the transition. And when you do that in this tautomer, you calculate all the transition with quantum chemistry methods. You calculate G square. One obtains this map of the pico cavity of the emission. It's a dipolar emission with the hydrogens like this. And this is the dipolar map, theoretical dipolar map of the coupling strength. But remember, the experimental image look like this. They don't look uh, equal to each other. Here on top, we address the emission properties but not the excitation. And we saw that for the emission, the total emission, we also need to count for how we excite the exciton, right? The pumping. So we need to do a transport property to see the population of this molecule. This is a little bit more complex for this seminar, but get the idea that the injection of the exciton is proportional to the OMO orbital, to the highest occupied molecular orbital to the square. So, this transition, which is connected with transport and tunneling properties through this molecule, is connected with the electronic orbital of the highest occupied molecular orbital. This highest occupied molecular orbital looks like this. This is something that people with tunneling microscopy with electrons could map. Okay. And now we need to bring this excitation map here on the left, which is this excitation map with the emission map of the dipolar uh, to produce the total emission rate. And when one makes the product of both uh, processes, one gets this complex emission final map of emission of this molecule. And this is exactly the kind of map that uh, Guillaume Schul and this tunnel microscopies achieve at the single molecule level. So again, and with this I'm, I'm done, we are obtaining information, photonic information of an exciton map and resolve at the atomic scale with photons. When we combine information of the atomic orbitals, uh, of the molecular orbitals and the properties of the mission enhanced via positive factor or whatever. So we are obtaining atomic scale photon maps of emission. In some way, now these picophotonic maps are uh, kind of competitors of the electronic maps, so to say, with different information. Okay. And, and to finish, uh, I just was saying that the third aspect I could touch some of the day or some of my collaborators could touch is the actual quantization of this local field, of this evanescent field, and how the quantization of this can, can produce very interesting nonlinearities, correlation or address correlation effects in both types of uh, spectroscopies, plasmon exciton or plasmon vibration. The idea would be now to precisely quantize the electromagnetic field associated with the plasmon here and here and see evolve with the master equation, how the populations of vibrations and excitons evolve and, and address, as I say, nonlinearities, correlations, and statistics, and so on. So with this, I think I'm gonna uh, acknowledge uh, some of the of the collaborators that I have in 30 seconds here in the last slide, and I will finish, but I really want to show them because they're an important part of all this we do in the group. And uh, these are them, yes. So we have here the group, 
Uh, currently, I want to acknowledge particularly Ruben Esteban, a very good collaborator of mine in San Sebastian since uh, eight years ago. Also, Thomas Newman, who is moving now from Harvard to, to Strasbourg and has done a lot of work on this uh, single molecular spectroscopy and the rest of, of the gang who are working hard in each aspect of the quantization of nanophotons. Okay, and with this, the acknowledgement of the experimental groups, Guillaume Shu, Sen Chao Dong in Strasbourg and China, Jeremy Bomber in Cambridge, and a bunch of theoretical people that we also collaborate with, Sanchez Portal in Avenitio in San Sebastian, Nicolai Schmidt and Alejandro Gonzalez Tuela for the quantization in optomechanics, which I didn't talk today about, and Francisco Garcia Vidal, also a, a friend and a visitor, where we did this molecular beyond the single point uh, type. Thank you. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Javier, for this very nice talk and for uh, suggesting a, a future uh, Martes Quantico. We take your word for that. And there are a, a few uh, questions. Uh, one is by David Sueco, uh, and he's uh, asking whether you can, uh, essentially, what is the relation between the coupling strength that you achieve or that you have computed in different systems and the cavity frequency is, is uh, uh, can you reach the ultra strong coupling regime in some cases? Okay, what I would say is, you mean, uh, I don't know if he means in general in, in cavity uh, photonics or in or more in this plasmonic cavities, right? Uh, in this, I guess, in this plasmonic cavities, in this plasmonic cavities, uh, achieve the strong coupling uh, regime is already difficult, as I show you, right? You need to to get extreme uh, situations of uh, alignment of the fields and the matter type of polarization to achieve uh, strong. So as he, as David mentions, well, for, to, for going to ultra strong coupling, then you need that this G is a substantial amount of uh, percentage of the energy of the cavity itself, right? Uh, so a 10% or, or, or something like that, right? And this is hardly, achievable in, in plasmonics for a cavity of 2 EV or, or, or you would need 200 milli EV or, or three or four a half a, an electron volt coupling. And this is very hard to get in, in exciton plasmon cavity. But as probably David Fuego knows himself, you can try to go to other type of coupling, dipole dipole coupling in the infrared, vibrational dipoles with uh, infrared cavities, right? And these infrared cavities are a little bit bigger. They don't have the, the limitations of losses and so on the, of, of the plasmonic cavities. And in a typical Fabry Perot, for example, the micro resonator or infrared resonator with a, a phononic material, then we have seen, and I think that Luis has also seen in, in a separate work, uh, but we have seen certainly how by filling the cavity, you, you go in the infrared, from uh, weak to strong and to ultra strong coupling. What are the implications in terms of quant the quantumness of that? Uh, I don't know, we are trying to explore, but in plasmon exciton coupling, I don't see a ultra strong coupling so far. Maybe with other emitters, another type of cavity, I don't know. Okay, there is a, another question by Inigo Iduskiza that says that uh, in the last work that you presented, uh, why are the time scales so different that you can have the factorization in pumping and emission? Uh, well, because, uh, because the exciton, the exciton dynamics is uh, slower, so to say, than all this uh, ultra fast uh, emission, so to say. So you have the tunneling electrons, actually, you can excite this exciton in different ways, right? You can do photoluminescence or electroluminescence. What I showed today is electroluminescence. We have another work where we have done the same with photoluminescence, right? But these are two independent processes in the dynamics and in the description. When, when you have electroluminescence, like what I mentioned today with the group of Strasbourg, first you have the tunneling current, which typically tunnels elastically, but a percentage of this tunneling electronic tunneling current tunnels inelastically. So a percentage of those, of those tunneling electrons lose energy, which is provided to, an, to the molecule to produce the exciton, right? So, and this is one of the processes. Once this pro is produced, remember that a typical 
a lifetime of an exciton in a molecule is nanoseconds or something. But of course, we put it in the molecule in the plasmonic cavity, and by porcel factor, this is accelerated, right? So it can be lower. And then once the exciton is produced, then this ultra fast process in the femtosecond, not femtosecond, because it's accelerated, but it can be picosecond or whatever, might be produced. Okay. So the excitation of dynamical process and the mm, emission decay process can be disentangled perfectly. Uh, it's, it's two time scales and it's two different uh, uh, processes. And, and you can do again the same, not with tunneling current, inelastic tunneling current, but with light. You just reduce the bias to a level where the current cannot excite the exciton, but you come with light and you excite the exciton. And again, you have fluorescence. And, and again, you can disentangle both processes, the excitation and the emission, even with, with light, light in, light out. This is a standardly done in photonics. OK, we have another question by Jorge Lobo uh, that I ask, how critical is to decouple the molecules from the substrate to get well-resolved plasmonic states experimentally with STM? This is a really good question, Jorge. I'm very glad to, to greet you um, in Zaragoza, to find in Zaragoza, I guess. <laughs> so, so yes, the, what, lo, what um, a very important effect that I didn't mention, but it's extremely important in, in emission from molecules to, to the far field, is that the exciton uh, cannot be quenched. And if you put your molecule too close to the metal, the once the exciton is formed, it immediately will decay into, into, into metal excitations in the heat and everything, right? So, so the decay of the exciton into the metal by direct touch, it's, it's, um, it's really harmful. So the secret of all these uh, tunneling microscopic groups, Saint Chaudon in Jefe, Guillaume Schul in Strasbourg, Wilson Hall in California, there are Richard Bernd in, in Kiel, all these groups, four or five groups who do this in the world, they, they managed to find that if you put sodium chloride monolayer, atomic monolayer separating the metal and the molecule, one is not enough. It's still quenched. Two, it's in the limit. And with three monolayers of sodium chloride, the molecule loses the, con the, the coupling, the direct quenching with the metal and it leaves sufficiently to emit to the particle. So the three, two to three sodium chloride monolayers are absolutely essential to get this electroluminescence or uh, photoluminescence from the tunnel junction. Okay, so there are no more questions. So thank you very much, Javier, for this excellent talk. And, uh, Okay, we will invite you in the future to continue this Thank discussion. Thank you for your invitation. The pleasure was mine. Thank you, Luis and David. Thank you very much. Okay, bye.